Hey there, my name is Ben Rodney from ASHRAE New York, and I want to welcome you to this episode of the ASHRAE New York Designer Series and the brand new ASHRAE New York YouTube channel. We'll be bringing you educational content, interviews, and chapter updates, and it'll be open to members and non-members alike, or anyone just interested in the HVAC industry or updates on our chapter. You can find us on LinkedIn, Instagram, and make sure to go to our website, ashrayny.org, where you can sign up for our newsletter, check up on chapter events, and hopefully even join us as a new member of the chapter. If you like what you see here, make sure to hit the subscribe button below this video, and then hit the bell to get notifications on any future updates to the channel. If you have any comments, questions, or conversation about this video, just leave them in the comment section. Thank you, and enjoy the episode. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to episode three of ASHRAE New York's Designer Series. We're so happy to have you here. Uh, my name is Ben Rodney with the ASHRAE New York chapter. Uh, and we're so happy today to welcome our new friends from uh, Paula Consulting Engineers, uh, Robert Voth and Wesley Lawson. Uh, they're gonna be doing a presentation day on energy modeling and strategies. Um, there's a few things we wanted to go through with you before we get started. Um, if you have any questions for the presenters throughout the presentation, uh, if you just go to the dashboard on the right on the side of your screen to the questions tab, you can enter those questions. Uh, at the end of the presentation, I will be asking some of those to our presenters and they'd be happy to answer them. Uh, this presentation is worth one PDH credit. Uh, at the end of the presentation, there's going to be a poll that comes up. You have to enter your information in that poll so that we get it and can send you your certificate via email. Uh, just make sure to turn off your pop-up blocker. If you have it, we've had some issues with that uh, where it pops up. People don't get it because they're pop-up blocker. On. So uh, just make sure. Um, there are some people joining us from out of state. Uh, this has been uh, approved by the Practicing Institute of Engineering. Um, we know it's approved in New York State, but just if you're out of state, make sure uh, you check in with whatever license requirements uh, follow in that. And then we will be following up uh, in the coming days with this, or maybe later today with a survey monkey. Uh, and we really appreciate you providing any feedback. Uh, I know our presenters love hearing about how well they did. Uh, and the Oops, there we go. So I also wanted to just show you we have a great upcoming schedule uh, of uh, three more designer series events. Uh, and we also have our chapter dinner meeting on next Tuesday. So because of the Memorial Day holiday, we're having an earlier chapter meeting this year, but that's going to be on electrification, heat pumps and thermal energy storage. We've already had some a lot of people signing up for that. Uh, our next three designer series are smart buildings. Fan Fundamentals and Disaster Preparedness presented by JBMB, Loring, and Cisco. So we're just really excited to have those uh, as well. So without uh, any more delay, I'm going to throw it over to uh, Bob to get us started. All right. Uh, okay. All right, can everybody see that? Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. We, we trust that you're uh, all safe and uh, successfully working from home. Uh, these are interesting times. Uh, this is a bit of a um, departure. We're not gonna be talking about COVID or any of the present situations today. We're gonna be talking about energy modeling. What we're going to go through is a lot of people think that energy modeling is primarily associated with LEED. We are going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about uh, how to use energy modeling from a project standpoint to set the path of a project, to evaluate a project early on. And we're going to provide a couple of examples uh, of buildings where the energy model went beyond actually a LEED uh, component of the project, even though both uh, case studies we're going to show you, all three case studies we're going to talk about are LEED certified. Uh, in the end, we're just going to also talk about a little bit about how you can take the uh, energy model and apply for uh, utility rebates. It's something that we're very active in, and uh, it's a great thing for your clients, uh, and it's something that you should keep in mind. 
in our agenda, we're just going to go through uh, the energy uh, modeling credit. You can read things here. We're going to do. We're going to talk about a couple of case studies, especially one where we evaluated an envelope for a client. Uh, we're going to touch a little bit on some new emerging emerging uh, technologies that we're seeing out there. And a lot of you are will be familiar with a number of them. And we'll uh, close with uh, utility rebates. Uh, Wes, I'll turn it over to you. All right. So as we go into these case studies, uh, just note that we are going to be using uh, LEED version 3, 2009. Um, the case studies continue to be relevant as the principles are still steadfast, regardless if it's LEED 3 or LEED version 4. Um, people say, why is the energy model so important? Well, if you look at your overall 110 credits possible, a third of them reside in the energy and atmosphere category. In addition to that, 20%, approximately 20% of your overall credits rely reside in the energy model credit alone. Therefore, if you're really looking to push the boundaries beyond those lead certification, whether it be silver, gold, or platinum, it's extremely important to pay attention to that category and maximize your points. So here's a breakdown of jumping into the category itself. You have to achieve at least a 10% savings if we're looking at new construction and new buildings to break, to break the prerequisite uh, threshold. At that threshold, you are not guaranteeing any points, but you're just meeting your prerequisite. As you move forward, every 2% savings that you get, you get an additional point. Uh, therefore, you really have to hit 12% on new construction, 8% on existing buildings to obtain your first point, which goes anywhere from zero up to 19 points. As you go to the next slide, we'll look at the corn shell application. The corn shell application isn't too much different, although what it does is it gives you added bonus points for your first incremental jump into energy savings and the points. So instead of your 12% being one point, your 12% savings is three points. It goes up from there, uh, instead of to a maximum of 19, goes up to a maximum of 21 points. As you look forward, that was lead version V3. This is the scorecard for lead version V4. Uh, now, again, as I said, all the principles remain steadfast. We're getting 33 points of the possible 110 from the ENA category and still 18 from the energy model category itself. Therefore, we're still right on the borderline of 20% overall points in regards to the model itself and a third of the points coming out of the energy and atmosphere category. As we move this forward, as Bob stated, you know, lead is important, energy is important, uh, being able to portray an ROI is important. All these things go into decision factors to help your to help educate your client, make them the best, uh, help them make the best decision possible, and move forward. Uh, the biggest thing is to start early. Um, every one of us on this on this webinar has got into the situation where we continue to go back and revisit old existing decisions that have been made and it spends time, it spends the owner's time, it's, it delays our path to, to market. So the most important thing is to start early, make decisions and move on. Uh, the other thing about the process is that the model can be performed for many different people. Uh, there are energy modeling consultants, there are uh, lead consultants, and there are also engineers that do their own energy modeling in-house. Uh, we happen to fall into the, fall into the last category where we not only do the design, but on many of our projects, we do the models as well. Um, some other things to note, again, as Bob stated, we're comparing ourselves in the model to 40% window to wall ratio. Uh, that's true for both the V3 and V4. So as we get incrementally higher than 40% window-to-wall ratio, 
you will see a penalty in the energy savings. Uh, we'll walk you through some case studies in regards to how you can get past that. Um, if you're looking at just maintaining a lead prerequisite, there are some other compliance methods that you can look at. The prescriptive method alone allows you to get a small quantity of points, but is also limited very much on the size of the building. So if you're doing anything over 100,000 square feet, you do not have the prescriptive method as an alternative. The other thing to be aware of, we're jumping in early, make sure you understand any of your code required uh, changes based on locale. Uh, for instance, Boston proper requires a 20% savings over ASHRAE, which would immediately thrust you into meeting your prerequisites and points for the energy and atmosphere category if you are pursuing LEED. So those types of things are very important to know when you jump in up front and how it affects not only the engineer, but the architect and the owner. Bob? So on the, uh, on the process, uh, it's very important to start early. Uh, we, we do a lot of energy models when the only thing we understand about the building is its orientation block and window to wall ratio. We'll plug in that block and then we'll begin uh, analyzing systems. And the, the, that drives a lot of uh, early uh, decisions for us. Uh, in terms of um, uh, the, the lead version that you're using, it's very important to understand that. And it's also important to understand some of the local stuff. I'm not sure how much everyone knows about the new IECC stuff coming out. Uh, but these codes are really going to drive uh, the need for engineering. Uh, it's a great thing for our industry, and it's a great thing for the uh, built environment. Now, on the um, on the process, I'm going to go through uh, a couple here that uh, you know that you'll see. They were both development projects, and uh, when we started looking at these very early on. Uh, we were uh, evaluating various system options. We were working with uh, buildings that had a very high, as much as 68% window to wall ratio. So we were looking at systems uh, and the goal on, uh, on these, uh, we definitely had a lead goal. So we had to understand what kind of system that we could use and what systems we could put in through the modeling process in order to facilitate the architectural nature of the project. First one I'm gonna talk about is the Comcast Center. Comcast Technology Center. Uh, this building is in Philadelphia. It's the second of two towers for Comcast. Uh, this was a joint venture between a developer and Comcast. And uh, we had about 64% vision glass. The very inter extremely interesting thing on this project is that it was in uh, FA, it was in FAR zone CMX3. FAR is the total free area ratio that you're allowed to build based on the uh, lot size. And for a project in CMX5 in Philadelphia, uh, the FAR gets a 50% square footage bonus. It was very important for this project because they wanted to put a four seasons on top of the, uh, the building. You can see in the left-hand picture there, the shoulders of the tower, that's the top of the Comcast space. And then the hotel rises above that. And it, it's a triple, this is a triple lead platinum. It's a, the Corn Shell is platinum, the Comcast uh, tennis space is platinum, and the NBC Studios are platinum. The hotel is not, uh, primarily because there's an eight gallon shower head uh, in each of the rooms and uh, it just knocks out the three records. This is a chill beam project. And we were able to do a lot of very interesting things uh, with the central plant due to the chilled beams. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, just a couple of highlighted things. Uh, we did use uh, the local steam loop, and uh, we have a lot of, uh, you know, there's, we recover at full load about 350 tons on the air side in this building. The only air that we drive around the building is the outside air. Uh, this this project is up in Boston. Uh, another example of a project that we we took to uh, platinum and again using chilled beams. Uh, it did fall into the stretch code requirement as West, said, but we pushed that through chilled beams, a high efficiency plant. On this, we used 
uh, condensing boilers. Now, this building sits in the seaport area of Boston. And if any of you are familiar with that city, its proximity to the Logan Airport restricts the height. Now, chill beams give us the ability to uh, definitely reduce floor to floor heights or uh, have, high, have higher ceilings on a set floor to floor. This particular developer used the chill beam uh, arrangement to put an additional floor on the building uh, so that the uh, chill beam through the energy modeling process had a development payback period. We gained about 30,000 square feet in the building uh, due to the additional floor. Uh, both this building and the Comcast Tower both have rainwater harvesting and air-to-air uh, -air, uh, heat recovery. I'm not sure how many of you have actually worked with chilled beams. Uh, they are, in, in our industry, fans have not changed their principles since they were invented. The only thing you can do to a fan is uh, limit the amount of air, uh, variable speed drives, but it's the most inefficient uh, delivery device in your system. So all of these, uh, a chilled beam system only delivers outside air throughout the building. So you reduce uh, your fan energy between 70 and 80%. And then we pipe chilled water around the building, put it in a coil right here, and we induce the air over that coil and then uh, take care of the load in the space through that coil. The dehumidification is in the outside airstream. <clears throat> so that's how we control uh, building uh, uh, humidification. Uh, the other thing is that um, these are capable of both heating and cooling, and they are uh, extremely quiet. You automatically get your indoor air comfort uh, point through the uh, way that they distribute the air. Uh, you can get many different styles of chilled of chill beams. We've uh, done some projects where we incorporate both the lighting and fire protection of the beam. Uh, you can do them exposed. You can put them in laying ceilings. Very, very maintenance free. There's uh, literally no fan noise in the room and there's no filter in the room. Depending on the room cleanliness, all you have to do is just vacuum the beam maybe once a year or twice a year. <clears throat> the um, chilled water that we run around the building, we run it at 56 degrees just for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, we don't provide condensation. We don't get condensation on the chilled beam and uh, we're able to use uh, really uh, great lift properties on the chillers to drive our chiller efficiency down in the 0.3, 0.2a category. Now I'll turn it to Wes. Thanks, Bob. So uh, now we're going to look at a little bit uh, a third case study. This one we went back in after the fact and analyzed every uh, ECM that we did throughout the process to to show a story of how we were able to get to a certain saving standpoint. Uh, this is very similar to Comcast Technology Center in that the bottom 26 floors are office. The 22 floors above that are residential. So what that required us to do was take two separate models and compare them each to the baseline. So we had a residential proposed model, a residential baseline model, an office proposed model, and an office baseline model. Uh, we worked through it intensively in SD to guarantee that at the end of the day, we were setting a path forward that would allow us to get to the lead gold requirement. And we stuck to that, checking back in every month, intermittently throughout every phase to make sure that we were continuing along the proper path to get our desired end result. This is important to note that it's on the lead core shell version three, noting that the three three point bump as soon as you get the 12% savings. Uh, and on this project, we were both the MEP engineer and we did the energy modeling. So we'll walk you through the ECMs. Uh, we start obviously at zero comparing to the baseline and where we ended up getting to was 14.8%. Uh, that achieved per the chart, four points, which every one of them was important to the owner in order to achieve lead gold. Uh, I'd like to explain this chart a little bit. Uh, the left percentage column is cumulative savings. So you'll see that increase and decrease throughout the ECMs. 
whether it's an additive or a subtractive ECM. Uh, the next column to the right will show you your ECM, that specific delta at each implementation. Uh, we've also tracked the cost premium so that we could understand where we get a lot of uh, bang for our buck, a very good ROI for items that aren't quite as, as extensive for what we're paying for. Last column being the accepted and rejected. Many of these were accepted, but we'll, we'll show you one that was rejected and how it may influence it. Uh, in addition, the green is architecture, the light blue is mechanical, the dark blue is plumbing, and the maroon color at the end is lighting. So this encompasses not only the MEP that we, we uh, look at, but also helps uh, educate what the architect and owner may be seeing at the end of this route, this process. So we'll look at the uh, facade. It's always the place where owners and architects like to start. Um, <clears throat> we looked at anything that varies from the 40% vision up to the 65% vision. As you've noted, the the seaport item, the uh, seaport project you just saw, and Comcast technology project you just saw came in about 65% window to wall ratio in the office space. Well, why is that pretty standard? Well, obviously the floor to floor can be differential depending on area of the country, whether or not you're adding floors to the building, trying to shrink the plenums and or the system that you're utilizing. But the age old floor by floor air handling units you can usually get about a nine and a half to 10 foot uh, piece of vision glass on a 14 and a half to 15 foot floor to floor. So that 65% is more or less within a few percentage points of where you're gonna be at a maximum. Bob, if you wanna go to the next slide, um, we also then are gonna, so what we did was we made our initial decision on the 65% window to wall ratio for the office. We put that in one category. And then as I said, we started looking at the other, the other portions of the model that's the residential model. So we'll look at the options there as well. As you can see, the window to wall ratio is higher on the residential. Why is that? Well, if you're doing cast and place concrete, and you're minimizing the amount of soffit that you have within the unit, the amount of vision glass that you can get for each floor is, is vastly greater, which puts the MEP engineer and the model at a, at a disadvantage, but it's something that can't be, you can break the principles of your normal 65% maximum. So you have to be aware of this and able to, to frame the conversation with your owner at all times. And if it wasn't hard enough with a, if you want to look at the next slide, as if it wasn't hard enough with a visual like that, the architect always presents this kind of visual to the owner. Uh, when, you're, when you're an ownership group and you're looking at leasing your space, getting renters in, uh, the option D that you're looking at there, uh, second from the right, <clears throat> is your code requirement of 40% window to wall ratio. But it's really hard not to convince yourself as the owner that you want option A, B, or E, because the amount of views that you get, especially from a high rise construction like this, are just superior views with the higher window to wall ratio. Again, this isn't uh, meant to be read, but all you can see here is that we took an office model, we took a residential model, and by looking at different options in each one of the each one of the options, tried to evaluate our best case in each one of the different components of the building. We made an extensive matrix uh, depicting what we could and could not accomplish depending on different window to wall ratios, different glass types at various portions of the building so that they could not only lease the residential portion, but the office portion of the building. So what did we find through that initial facade analysis? 
what we found is that when you incorporate the maximum window to wall ratio on each one of the floors, plus the other areas that were conditioned, we ended up with about 61% overall for the building, window to wall ratio for the office, and 56% for the residential. If we were to compare the same code requirement performance for the facade at these higher elevated window to wall ratios compared to the window to wall ratio of 40% as depicted in the baseline, we immediately drop to a negative. So when our end goal is 14% and we start our base case at negative 4%, we have quite an uphill climb, over 18% uphill climb to, to take on and find a way to overcome that. So the first thing we looked at was triple pane glass. Uh, triple pane glass in itself had a seven and a half percent increase, which put us back to almost a four percent positive. Uh, the issue here is what is looking at the premium of the cost. This was almost twelve million dollars to take the project from code required glass type to triple pane glass. Therefore, we were tasked with the following. They asked us to pick a very good enhanced double pane glass, good shading coefficient, good assembly value, and work with that as our new baseline and apply the MEP systems on top of that. What that did was that brought us in at around 5%, which helped us get at least above zero to 0.3% 0 before we started into the items. If you want to go to mechanical items, uh, there were some items that we had to buy and some items that we figured out how to manipulate the systems. Um, upon initial investigation, obviously, we had to go to very high efficiency chillers in the office space. And from, from, a, from a metering requirement, we stayed with heat pumps in the residential portion. That being said, even though we were there heat pumps, they were high efficient variable speed compressor heat pumps. Uh, the other item that we looked at is Bob referenced on CTC and Seaport is that we utilize dedicated outdoor air systems with energy recovery. Uh, we put VFDs on all fans, on all pumps, and we found a way in the third item to actually share rejected heat between the office loop and the residential loop. So we have, we actually went through two years cycles where we shared so much heat between the rejected from the office into the residential that we did not run the boilers in the residential system component, which is a huge cost energy savings. And being able to model that rejected heat and capturing that allowed us to, for a very small amount of cost, diverting valves and controls allowed us to take a large jump of four and a half percent increase in the energy model and that's real dollars at the end of the day as well. You wanna go into the plumbing category. We looked at things that we could do there. Uh, we went to low flow plumbing fixtures and since domestic hot water is a very big portion, especially of a residential building, that had a large increase on the overall energy savings. That 2.1% wouldn't be, would be much higher. It was, it was a thermal family building but since the load profile of the office is so high, that percentage savings gets watered down. But two percent is still a good is still a good jump. The other thing we did from day one is we took micro turbines and we held that design to the side and held the dollars below the line for the owner. At the end of the day, they were faced with a decision of whether to stay lead silver or enact that adder in order to lead gold. And although there is a decent sized cost premium there, it was a no brainer to purchase those micro turbines and apply them to the domestic hot water and the residential in order to take the building from lead silver to lead gold. The other item we looked at is the reduced lighting density in the office space. Um, for reasons that were outside of the project control, we couldn't utilize that. But as you know, if you use tenant requirements and write them into the lease, you can also use that in your energy modeling. So we looked at doing that on this project, although uh, we didn't, we were not able at the end of the day to take advantage of that. 
So if we look at it cumulatively, we like to think that we saved the owner five and a half million dollars and still achieve their goals. We looked at that triple pane glass and it was cost prohibitive, bumping the entire project budget by 5% just for glass. So what we did is we took a step back, a deep dive, and with the help of the enhanced double pane glass, uh, provided the option for the owner of another way to get there uh, using the double pane glass instead. So just cycling this forward to the next slide, what we did here is we highlighted the important decisions that were made. The double pane glass was an important decision. The decision to put a little bit of cost towards the high efficiency chillers and heat pumps was a big decision. The miscellaneous upgrades that we were able to utilize to share heat between the office and the residential was a very low cost, very high impact item, which really drove it forward. And the last item on top of that was micro turbine election. That made a, that changed the building profile from lead silver to lead gold, which had a very uh, big benefit for the owner. So a couple of additional items, uh, what worked and what did not work in this building. Uh, now, what we're showing as high result items are exactly that for a high rise building. Uh, note that these are not high result items for every type of building. For instance, the window to wall ratio would not be as important for a one story warehouse. And the white roof, although important for a one story warehouse, does not have very much of an impact on a high rise construction building. So the window to wall ratio was big. The window performance was a huge impact. The shading coefficient was, was a big impact because almost all of our buildings cool 9% of the year, especially in categories, uh, climate categories four and, and south of that. The HVAC system types has a big impact and the lighting densities and HVAC controls also have a large payback as well. So the other thing to keep in mind is that when we have the, when we evaluate the facade, this is something that at times either a manufacturer or another consultant has to be brought into. It isn't just the performance of the glass itself. This isn't just a center of glass value that we can carry through the model. We have to understand how this comes together, where's our break points, where we're thermally breaking it, how much metal is in the assembly. All these things have to be analyzed up front so that we know at the end of the day when the building is gets into shop drawing and gets into construction, we can still meet the criteria. And the last thing that we need to make sure that we're aware of is location, location, location. Same as real estate is what we have to be aware of as when we do our energy modeling. There are loopholes and differences between on your climate zones for the ASHRAE modeling requirements. There's also, as we discussed earlier, local code requirement deltas in each one of those climate zones and in each area. So you have to be very well versed in all those minor modifications so that you're not just blindly taking what you think is a result in one area and trying to apply the same thought to another. We actually did a overall study for a large developer and a, and a commercial building was lead gold in one area and one mile away, it did not meet the lead prerequisite. So all of those things are very important that you have to pay attention to in order to make sure that you're giving your developer, your owner, your architect, the best information and accurate information. And that particular case Wes is talking about is right between the four and five line up by, up by New York. So uh, just to touch on a few things, uh, here we're 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 doing a lot of work with micro turbines. We're um, uh, big fans. Uh, we're, we're using the um, 
modular type. Uh, as Wes said, we use micro turbines on the FMC tower at a cost, and uh, but the but the net savings uh, for that owner was about uh, six million dollars applying micro turbines to the project. Solar and wind has uh, certain applications. Uh, you know, solar due to the SREX uh, is, is a big driver with the government help. Uh, same thing with wind. Uh, fuel cells, I don't know how much um, uh, any of you are familiar with those, but Bloombox uh, Bloom had just opened a facility in Delaware. Uh, the, the discharge uh, heat on that is very low grade heat. It's about 110 degrees. So they have um, uh, some specific applications uh, that uh, where they work well. View dynamic glass. Now that's the glass you can see down there in the picture where we actually are, are changing the uh, temperature of the glass to offset the solar gain through the space. Uh, we're using uh, that type of glass in very large uh, glass enclosed winter gardens or glass enclosed lobbies for building. Chilled beams, uh, we chatted about a little bit. Uh, and VRF, VRF, just like chilled beams, uh, goes right after the fan transport horsepower. So VRF is, uh, is a great energy saver. It's got some uh, innate uh, heat recovery ability to it. We're using it predominantly in the uh, multifamily. Uh, market and uh, just like chilled beams, we're like I said, dramatically as much as 70% reducing the uh, amount of air that we're running around the building. Underfloor uh, air distribution uh, to us is basically a user, um, we have to have the right user. For instance, all of our work over at MetroTech for the city call centers and PSAC 1 and 2 in Brooklyn, uh, all that. All, all of those buildings you utilize under floor air distribution. They're very, very dense buildings uh, with pods for uh, the 911 callers. Uh, the um, LED lighting uh, in certain areas in New York City, it's pretty tough to apply the LED lighting uh, simply because of the way that the, the codes uh, interpret it there. They, they put the rack in the electrical room where it doesn't belong. Uh, but in other locales, we're uh, able to use um, uh, point, you know, the, the LED lighting, and that's uh, you're, you're really transferring all the load of the lighting into one central room, and uh, you, you're driving it over uh, your low voltage distribution system. In the end, uh, for your clients, once you have an energy model, and once you've taken a a, lead, a building lead. Uh, don't forget to check with the utility. These are just a few examples of rebates uh, that we have uh, achieved for clients on various projects. And it's a, it's a pro programs that we're working with the local utilities uh, in, in all these locations to uh, basically send the client a check. And of course, you know, the utility pays us to do it. But the, these programs are very popular and don't lose sight of them. If you're not familiar with them, look into them, contact your local utility and be a, be a partner with your local utility to uh, provide rebates to your clients. Uh, you can see on uh, Comcast, uh, that was a pretty significant rebate uh, as well as FMC. So anyway, the... Um, the, the whole thing on this energy modeling, uh, in addition to lead, is the uh, incentive returns that you can provide to your clients. Okay, um, when you when you talk about uh, modeling, think of it more as a engineering tool, as well as a lead tool, and you know, and then go after the uh, utilities uh, uh, for the rebates. Uh, you're going to find out that uh, you get a very happy client. And if you look at your utility bill, there's a little column there where you can see that that uh, rebate money is built into your bill every day of the week. So it's not like the utility's really giving anything away that they haven't collected from you. So that's our program today. I don't know if uh, you want to take the screen back or uh, if there's any questions that have come in, but it's been a pleasure discussing this with you. Yeah, it's like to finish a little early. Yeah. We appreciate that, guys. Um, for, whoops, let me back in there so I'm actually looking at my camera. Uh, we So if there's anyone else out there that has uh, any questions, please type them into the questions box. I'm sure we could get a good discussion going here with Wes. 
and uh, and Bob. Uh, we do have uh, a question from Edwin. It's it's somewhat of a general question, but how do you how do you evaluate all the different systems during early design of a project uh, to determine what might be appropriate for the building that you're looking at? Wes, you want to take that? You want me? To Sure. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously experience goes into it. Uh, there are systems that work very well with project types, project sizes, project geometry, uh, which rules out or elects a handful of items, uh, systems in each project type and size. Uh, beyond that, uh, you also have to look at what the energy components are, what the goals are, whether it's made. Uh, lead gold, lead platinum, uh, code. Some people just want to build code building, and that's fine as well. Um, the other item that you have to keep in mind is, you know, anything that we need from a zoning standpoint. Like Bob said, you know, that was really driven. That those chill beam systems were driven by the requirements of certain areas in AHJs, and that really drove chill beams and therefore you know, a slightly more expensive system, but there were large benefits to get out of that. So some of it's experience, some of it's just right sizing it to the building. And there's also a, uh, you know, an other factor from both component that has to be evaluated. So I, yeah. I know that was a vague response. <laughs> well, it I can really matter that it depends on project type size. I'll, I'll speak to it as well a little bit. Uh, you know, a lot of it is based on our experience in terms of uh, what works well and what doesn't work well. And we, we're able to uh, build a block of a building in an early modeling process. And from past models, we'll actually import performance criteria into that model to see what uh, occurs when we apply different systems. For instance, someone came to us with a hospitality hotel project or a multifamily project with operable windows, we wouldn't talk about chill beams because the chill beams will sweat uh, when the, the windows open. It's not a good application for that. Uh, depending on what part of the country we're operating in, uh, variable refrigerant is, is always an option for multi-use. Uh, you get into some parts of the country where the contract, our, our partners in the contracting community are not familiar with variable refrigerant, even though it's, um, uh, a very efficient system, the pricing point due to the unfamiliarity of, of the, on the installation side can throw it out. So I would say that it's probably 80% experience in, in terms of what we know that, if, that works. Uh, to Wes's point on chill beam, uh, chill beams are definitely uh, more expensive as much as uh, eight bucks to nine bucks uh, in Philly or New York for um, in Boston for a, over a conventional uh, floor by floor VAV or you know, conventional VAV system. So we look at a lot of variables early on. We build a block on the percentage window to wall ratio with the architect's glass performance. And then we start playing with uh, system types that are appropriate to the project. Fantastic. I appreciate it. Just wanted to, uh, I know that some people, uh, uh, Wes, I think your connection might be a little um, uh, a little bad here and there. So just for everybody, if you're having trouble hearing, it's, we, we're 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 working on it. But um, uh, if there's any questions later, anything you need clarification on, you can always email us at ashrayNYC at Gmail. We'll make sure to get that uh, covered. So we have uh, another question: If the building is using gas, I believe it is true that the baseline systems must use gas. If that is the case, how much penalty can we expect by using VRF and other electric heating based systems in areas where the gas rate is low relative to electric per BTU? And I can repeat that if you need me to. So if. No, it's an uh, understood question. It, that, that is something that you have to account for. Um, there's absolutely situations where you would normally put gas to a makeup air unit that may want to be electric so that it properly depicts what your proposed, uh, what your baseline model will be so that you can get the most points and savings out of that. 
Um, there is, you know, to that end, there's a conversation that you may have to have with your owner that says, if I use gas in your makeup air unit, I save you three cents a square foot per year in operating costs, but I cost you three lead points when I go to electric, uh, or when I, I cost you three lead points by doing that, where if I were to keep that as electric heat in my makeup air unit and do VRF throughout, I would get more lead points for you. So there is absolutely a game and a conversation you have to have with your owner in regards to what drives the performa or the lead credits, and they're not always in alignment. Uh, the one other point on that, yeah, you can go upside down on the uh, energy supply side of that, but on a VRF, when you look at the, uh, the gas is gonna be coupled with the standard fan uh, transport horsepower and the fan transport horsepower savings in the VRF. Now this is all the side, depends on the mass of the building, a smaller building you wouldn't get there, but on a, on a large building, the fan transport horsepower would far away uh, going upside down a little bit on the other side of it. Great. Hey, Wes, I'm going to try something. I'm just going to hide your video and leave the audio and to see if that improves the connection. So just, just making you aware. I don't, I don't know, but we're going to try it. Okay. Uh, we have another question. Uh, beyond the lead, do you ever get to evaluating occupant comfort, uh, i.e. ASHRAE 55 and or overheating uh, in relation to your energy modeling? Yeah, I, um, uh, doing that finite evaluation is more of a CFD analysis than an energy model analysis. But in all lead projects, one of the points is ASHRAE 55 thermal comfort. So you do have to analyze that and show compliance in one method or another. If it's not from a CFD perspective, you at least have to show uh, compliance per the comfort in this psychometric chart. Yeah, I was I would I was going to uh, say the same thing uh, when we moved to uh, like drafts at windows and air distribution in a room. Uh, we really move into a more of a CFD modeling for that aspect of it. We often do that to prove whether or not we're going to need uh, an auxiliary heat at the uh, perimeter in, in the form of a baseboard or something for human comfort or a very, very tall glass uh, uh, structure uh, for draft control at the perimeter. So we, we, we would move over to CFD modeling for that. Great. Um, another question. Are there condensation concerns with radiant cooling? Uh, Assuming humidification control of air is used, how does the cost of radiant cooling plus air humidification compare with just having full air conditioning system? So I guess the question, it may be from an energy modeling standpoint, do you see differences with a radiant cooling system versus other more uh, traditional types of systems? So on radiant cooling systems, uh, we're doing some uh, student housing with balance systems, which is a type of that. Uh, a lot of the uh, healthcare patient rooms uh, will use radiant systems, but we're not really applying a lot of radiant cooling in the office space environment. Uh, a form of that we're, we're doing in uh, large areas where we've got high soar gain, we'll put in radiant floors to capture the heat before it hits the space. Uh, but from a from the standpoint of uh, radiant panels, uh, just like a chilled beam, uh, if you have an operable window or raise, you know, artificially raise the interior uh, humidity requirement, they will sweat. Uh, it, it, right at the moment, we are not applying a great deal of radiant panelized uh, cooling systems. And to that end, in regards to the humidification comment, that is something that you have to evaluate with your architect and your uh, envelope consultant and or the individual that's brought on board as the manufacturer, the curtain wall manufacturer, because you do have to be aware of the different locations and the internal humidity content to figure out if you're gonna have sweat conditions. And if so, how to minimize that. 
Mm -hmm. in, in any radiant systems that you have looked at, have you seen any uh, energy savings or cost savings when modeling a, a radiant system versus uh, another type of system? Or maybe there's not enough information to, to yeah, evaluate. Yeah, I, I would tell you that um, I, I could speculate. We have uh, modeled a radiant uh, a radiant panelized uh, cooling system in a space or a, res or a multifamily uh, use. Uh, in uh, healthcare, uh, they're fairly popular in the patient rooms, and that's really driven as much by the client uh, familiarity and what they want to do with the, the building as, as much as ourselves. And those mm -hmm. typically not lead projects. Well, and the other component of that is inevitably transferring water to cool or heat rather than utilizing fans is a more effective, energy efficient way to condition the space. So yeah, that, that's where that's where it would end up. It, yeah. it would, you're you're uh, distributing a hydronic as a medium for your uh, uh, energy rather than air. Right. All right. So we'll move we'll move on to the next question. Can you give a brief description of the micro turbine technology that you mentioned? I know I know you guys were talking about that with the domestic water and and I I even had some questions about that whether you analyzed I know there was like a half a million dollar upcharge to I think ECM charged a, or a cost to put it in uh, mm -hmm. wondering if there's any energy savings of that and then maybe a description on the on the technology itself. Yeah, we've been using um capstone micro turbines a lot to do that but essentially what the micro turbine does is it takes a fuel source mainly gas burns the gas and you get two things out of it you get electricity and you get waste heat uh, if you do not capture the waste heat the micro turbine is not efficient enough that you can just turn gas into electricity and make money that being said, if you find a way to capture the waste heat, the combination of the electrical savings that you get back, combined with the amount of heat that you can reallocate is what really saves you money. So we use that uh, most easily for domestic hot water in multifamily buildings with the waste heat because there is a constant need, A, 365 day a year need for that. Yeah, now on the application of micro turbine, it's, it's vitally important not to oversize them. Uh, I'll speak specifically to FMC because we uh, talked about that one earlier. Uh, the micro turbines on that job are sized to handle the base load electrically that occurs 24 7 in the building. That's for public area lighting in the offices, uh, corridors. And so we run that at night and then we put in. Um, storage capability and made uh, domestic hot water for the residential piece on top of it. So it turned out to be a um, an excellent application and that and bear in mind that that the premium for that offset a triple glazing premium uh, so that they actually saved a great the, the owner developer saved a great deal of money and still got to lead even though they uh, spent for the micro turbines. Those micro turbines are set up in bypass mode. What that means is when there's no need for rejected heat, you have to run air across them to cool them. And you don't want to turn them off simply because you can create a spike in your electrical consumption. So you need to look at each situation um, individually on micro turbines. That's a, a bank of, uh, I forget the sizes, Wes, you would know. Uh, and, but they're they're modular, and the other thing is you want to look at when you have when you've got a micro turbine out of line for service, you want to be able to keep them on because you don't want to play with a spike in uh, in your demand. Yep, limiting that peak, that electrical demand limits your multiplier for your electrical bill for the entire month. So it's really important that they stay up and live. You you need to really understand the local utilities demand uh, charge aspects. Because if you if you take if you put micro turbines in a building and you take them offline, you can create a demand penalty for the client uh, that's pretty tough to digest. 
Yeah, and, and staying on that, we have two more questions and we have about six minutes left. And just staying on that topic for, for a brief moment, in, in, with, with Local Law 97 in New York uh, versus other cities, are you seeing, do, do you have other clients that are still uh, asking about the use of micro turbines in other cities more than uh, in New York where the, the need or the request for them might be declining? Uh, I don't know. We're, we're we're applying a great deal of micro turbines, and we're we're putting uh, a bunch in in Lafrac City in New York. But that's also there's a tax incentive in New York City to do that, based on what you can handle a year. Uh, micro turbines in the in the Boston region, due to the stretch code, are uh, are quite popular. Uh, I would say as we would say in our southern work. Uh, not not quite as much, wouldn't you agree, Wes? The yeah. Further the further north we go, the more micro turbines. I think it's due to climate and you know, local utility structures. Right, but you you know you're right in the fact that if people are saying they want to get rid of fossil fuels, uh, New York being one, Seattle being another, uh, you have to be careful with that application. So it's really a, there's no doubt about it that it saves you money. It's, you know, sometimes it just comes down to the owner's palate and what side of that, what kind of stance they want to take on that aspect. In our, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, sorry. In our, in our higher ed work, uh, we're doing a lot of micro, you know, they, they understand the long-term viability of a building. And uh, with this advent of no fossil fuel, it'll be interesting to see. I have a personal jaundice on that due to the um, how do you generate electricity and what are the line losses to get it to the building for the overall environment. That's a whole other topic. It's another topic for another day. <laughs> that's a, that's a deep dive. That um, just uh, two more questions. What are some uh, issues slash comments that you typically receive during the lead review? So may maybe some of your... Uh, uh, you know, standard standard responses that you see, or any or any highlights that you'd want to mention. In the early days, it was it was around the model. The uh, review process has has gotten quite a bit better, and I would say for about three or four years, we've had very very few comments on any of our models that um, we have, we have submitted. We sit on the USGBC. Uh, we understand uh, how they review it and what they look for. If none of you know, it's like an audited tax return. They're looking for outliers. So you, you don't want to put at risk to your client a, a stretch in the model that's going to, going to stand out. Um, you know, so that they're really auditing the model and looking for these outlier uh, situations. Wes, I don't know if you have any other comments on that. Yeah, I mean, the only other thing that, you know, we haven't had this issue in a lot of years, but the uh, I know that the unmet load hours can become difficult for some people where you keep making minor adjustments just to get that down and that may bump the sides of your systems um so that's a really iterative process but again we know what they're looking for and the maximum number and you have to do what you have to do to stay under them yeah and if you're going to stretch one of those brackets uh you should submit your model with the commentary uh, so that they, they understand it ahead of time on FMC because we actually combined two models into one. It was a very difficult model for them to review. We had to have um, some actual live conversations to walk them through it uh, because they weren't used to looking at uh, two models combined for a result. Great. And uh, I'll get this one in. Uh, both of these are from a, a gentleman named Edwin. Uh, what software are you using to do your modeling? Use a number of different. Uh, okay, so HAP, uh, Trace, and EQuest. And do you use one versus the other for a particular situation? Depends on the release. <laughs> so they, every 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 year, one becomes a little bit better. You know they. Uh, we're we're versed in all of them. So Do you see we, any major differences in the results uh, modeling one versus the other? Uh, let's say it right now at this point in time. Not enough to drive the decision for us. Uh, no. uh, and right. you know, some of them are a little bit more user friendly than others. 
if it's a simpler building and a simpler model, we may use one uh, software over another where some of them are more in depth that you know lend themselves to certain building types. Yeah, on, the, on Comcast, that was an eQuest model because there were so many moving pieces in that. We um, double passed the condenser barrels, saved 700 horsepower on the condenser uh, pumping stream uh, to the cooling towers, and there was no way really to, to get that to work in anything other than eQuest. So e eQuest tends to be the most sophisticated, and if you have a very sophisticated building, you might be better off using it. It can't be a paper tiger. So. Mm -hmm. Maybe. But uh, I'm sure that uh, Hap and Trace are the most popular out there, and they're both accepted. So pick pick mm -hmm. your pick your tool. I don't know that we have a yeah. We have, this is our last question, and then we'll end the presentation uh, because it is one o'clock. In your experience, uh, can you speak on any reasonable strategies for dealing with retrofit projects, or any important questions to ask for retrofit projects? Envelope, envelope, envelope. <laughs> <laughs> envelope and floor to floor height yeah so uh you know now i'll tell you depending on the type of retrofit project is it, that it is once you take a building and uh let's say it's a concrete building and you're going to um, condition it properly your dew point's going to change inside the wall structure you need to be very careful of that uh so we we really look hard at the at the envelope on uh, retrofit buildings. If you're taking a building that's been there for X number of 40 years, and it was built far before anyone really understood vapor barriers and, and things like that, and it's never in its life had a had new upgraded systems in it that makes that envelope uh, react differently. Okay, well, we really appreciate it. Bob West, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, thank you uh, and thank Paula and for everybody that's on there make sure to fill out the poll when it comes on uh, you'll get your certificate soon uh, make sure to fill out the uh, survey monkey when you receive it and check out ashrayny.org for our future events so thanks and have a great day take care be safe